Okay, so I'm going to go through the solutions to the mock questions that came up this year in 2020, both on the DEB paper and on the exam craft paper. So we'll begin with this one here, question 1A. In a random sample, it was found that 55% of the respondents were male, 45% were female, 75% of the male surveyed and 62.5% of the female survey read the local newspaper weekly. Okay. If a person is chosen at random, what's the probability that the person is female, given that the person reads the local newspaper? Now, in a question like this, there are two breakdowns. Male and female read the local newspaper, don't read the local newspaper. So immediately I kind of think of a tree diagram, and that will give you every possibility, every probability in terms of males who read and males who don't read, females who read and females who don't read. So maybe we'll just get that written out. So the random sample gives us males and females okay now we're told that 55 percent that's 0.55 again go back to financial maths never use a percentage as a symbol use it as a decimal so that must be 0.45 in relation to the females now of the males we have those who read and those who don't read and likewise with the females we have those who read and those who don't read so let's see what they are 62.5 percent of the females read so that's down here so that's point 625 and 75% of the males 0.75 now the other arms on those particular parts of the tree diagram are the values that bring them up to 1 so that must be 0.25 here and that must be 0.375 here okay so once you've got your tree diagram what I would immediately do is multiply all the arms so run up this arm here that way then run this way here like that then this way and so on so just run that way let me take those marks off run that way in order to see exactly what the overall products are for each arm okay so 0.55 by 0.75 not 0.4125 0.55 by 0 0.25, 0 0.1375. 0.45 by 0 0.625 is 0.2813. And 0.45 by 0 0.375, 0 0.1688. It's great to be able to do it in your head that quickly. No, they're written down. I have the solutions to these ones done. Okay, so there's all the probabilities. Okay, now what are we asked? If a person is chosen at random, what is the probability that the person is female given that the person reads the local newspaper? The probability that the person is female given that they read the local newspaper. Now straight away, because we're given that the person reads the local newspaper, we are reduced down to just those outcomes. So this one, they're readers, they're the male readers, and they're the female readers. So straight away, the bottom of my fraction is the sum of these two. So you add these two together and that gives you 0.6938. And out of those two, only one of them refers to females. And that's this line here, which happens to be 0.2813. So if you follow it again, these two that I've ticked, they happen to be the total that's given that the person reads the local newspaper. So you add the two arms that refer to readers which is the two I have ticked. And out of those two that I have ticked, only the bottom one refers to female readers. So that's the top of your fraction. And that gives you 0.4054. Now, are there any restrictions on my answer? No. What's the probability? Answer, if you want to, 40.54%. That's it. So that's P of female given that they read the local newspaper weekly. Okay. Let's look at the next part. 12 discs numbered 1 to 12 are placed in a bag. Three discs are drawn at random without replacement. Now, when you hear that without replacement, you have to remember that that means that the events are not independent. Okay. If you take out something and leave it out, the future probabilities are affected. So therefore, they are not independent. So just keep that in mind. So 12 discs numbered 1 to 12 are placed in a bag. Three discs are drawn at random. Without replacement, what is the probability that the number 9 is drawn? Now, in a situation like that, all we've got to think of is we've got three discs drawn, okay? There is one out of the 12 happens to be a 9. If you draw the 9 on the first go, then that means that there are 11 numbers left that are not 9 out of 11, which is 1. 
So you could, if you want to write down, okay, 11 over 11. And then if you take one more out with a replacement, that's 10 out of 10. Now that just means that you're multiplying by one twice. Yes, it does. So the answer is one over 12. That's it. Now, what about if the nine is drawn second or third? Well, in that case, you'd have to make sure that this one, remember, is only one arrangement. If the nine is drawn first, so you've got a nine, not a nine, not a nine, and not a nine, okay? But that's only one arrangement. So you might also have maybe not nine, a nine, and not nine, or you might even have not nine, not nine, and a nine. Now, the one thing about this is that if one over 12 is a probability of drawing a nine first, then 1 over 12 is going to be the probability for the other two. So it can be this one, or it could be this one, or it could be this one here. What does or mean? Or means add. So it's a twelfth plus a twelfth plus a twelfth. Now if you don't believe me, check it. Not 9. Let's just try one of them. Let's try this one here. Not 9. Well, that's 11 out of 12. There are 11 out of 12 numbers that are not 9. Okay. Then I want to draw 9. That's 1 out of the remaining 11. And then I want to draw not 9, which would bring me to 10 out of the remaining 10. Look what happens. They cancel, they cancel, and you're left at 1 over 12. So even if you take the long way round and work out all the probabilities individually, that's okay, because the cancellation will still give you the same answer. So what do I end up with? A 12th plus a 12th plus a 12th, which is 3 twelfths, which happens to be 1 over 4, or 25%, if you want to do it in terms of percentages. That's it. Okay, let me just get my oops, daisy. Let me just get B. Here's my notes. Let me just get my little eraser and take that out. So I don't want 112. I just want 12. Okay. Blue. Okay. Next one. What is the probability that the three numbers on the discs drawn are even? So that means I want the probability of even and the probability of even and the probability of even so therefore from 1 to 12 6 of those are even so 6 out of the 12 are available for first selection if I remove one of them and I don't put it back in again then 5 of the remaining even numbers out of the 11 are available for the second one and 4 out of the remaining 10 are available for the third one okay now the probability three numbers on this drawn are even so that's all you've got to do multiply these out so we can do a bit of cancellation here six and six goes once twelve goes twice we then have two and two and once and two into four goes twice and then we have two into that goes and that goes two and two goes once and ten goes five times and the five cancels there see so don't always reach your calculator what's the answer one over eleven that's it 1 over 11. So just work out the probabilities individually. It all goes back to when we were dealing with the words and and the word or. Okay. If you're dealing with and, what's the probability three numbers on the disc drawn are even? That's even and even and even. You just put down the individual probabilities and multiply them out. Okay. So that's 1 over 11. Now next one. What is the probability that the product of the three numbers drawn is even? Now how do we get an even number by multiplication? The answer is we have to multiply by at least one even number. If you multiply odd numbers together, they'll stay odd. So in order for me to get an even product, notice that, an even product, one at least, listen to my language, at least one of the three must be even. So if I'm looking at the probability of at least one of the three numbers being even, remember I told you about the questions in relation to at least? What's the other way to state that? It's at least one of them must be three means none of them can't be three. So we don't want no three, no evens. I mean, sorry, we don't want no evens. Okay. So at least one of the three must be even, which means that the other statement to that is one minus the probability of no evens. See? So that's the easier way to calculate that one. So at least one of the three must be even means that we are excluding no evens. So one minus no evens would be exactly the same as at least one of three being even. I hope that makes sense to you. So no evens, what does that mean? Well, we've already worked out here. If you just take a look back up here quickly, what does that represent? That represents that the three numbers on the disks are even. 
So therefore, if there's no evens, surely that's going to be 1 minus 1 over 11, which is 10 over 11. That's it. Now, again, if you want to see the mathematics behind that, take the probability of no evens. Let's just take that over there. So this means 1 minus what? Well, no even. That's If I just ignore the even numbers, that brings me down to 6 over 12 straight away, because half the numbers are odd. Yeah, And another non-even, which would be 5 over 11. Do you see straight away? It's the same multiple we had in the previous part of the question. And 4 over 10. And again, if you cancel all of those down, 6 into 6 goes once, into 12 goes twice. 2 into 2 goes once, into 4 goes twice. 2 into 2 goes once, into 10 goes 5 times. And 5 into 5 goes once, and again you're left at 1 over 11. So it becomes 1 minus 1 over 11, which I told you already, is 10 over 11. So when you hear the word at least, then you just always think of what the opposite statement will be. And the opposite statement will be that no evens. If at least one even has to be present, then the opposite of that is that no evens. So at least 1 out of 3 is even means 1 minus probability that there's no evens present. Okay, And because there's no evens, no even and no even and no even has the same probability as even and even and even from the previous part of the question. I hope that makes sense to you. So anyway, 10 over 11 is the answer to that one. Okay, question two. Five students were asked to solve a mathematical puzzle. The probability of each student solving the problem respectively is two thirds, one half, one quarter, three eighths, and an unknown called A. Given that the probability of all five students solving the puzzle is 3 over 160, calculate the value of A. Now, if all five students are solving the puzzle, that's the first student solves and the second solves and the third solves all the way up as far as the fifth one. So that means that 3 over 160 must be the answer I get when I multiply the probability of success from every student. OK, so 2 over 3 multiplied by 1 over 2 multiplied by 1 over 4 multiplied by 3 over 8 multiplied by A. OK, so because there's one variable, I can solve this. Before you start multiplying anything, look for cancellation. 3 and 3 cancels, 2 and 2 cancels. And what does that leave you with? 3 over 160 is equal to 1 over 32 times A, because 4 eighths are 32. Now, bring the 1 over 32 to the other side. It becomes 32 over 1 times 3 over 160 is equal to A. So that means that, again, if we 96, just multiply it out, 96 over 160 is equal to A. And you can break that down, and that breaks down into 3 fifths. 3 over 5 is equal to A. So now we know the probability of A as being 3 over 5. Okay. Next part. Find the probability that at least one of the students solves the problems. Here we go again. Notice this time to put it in bold for you. At least one. That means not none. So if at least one of the students solves the problem, then we're not allowed to have no students solving the problem. So at least one means one minus the probability that none of them solve it. So one minus the probability that none solve or that they all fail to solve it. And if I want 1 minus the probability of none solving, what does that mean? I've got to go back here and realise that if these are the probabilities of success, then one third, let's just write out a list here, one third, one half, three quarters, uh, five eighths, and what do we say A was? A was three fifths and two fifths. They're all the probabilities of failure. So if they are the probability of successes, the opposite to those fractions that make up one, they must be the probabilities of failure. So what we're going to do now is multiply all of these together because they will give me the probability that everybody fails. But I want to take that away from one to find out the fact that at least one solves the problem. OK, so what do we end up with down here? We end up with the probability. Uh, I had that P in already, don't need it again. Uh, one minus. So we just put in these fractions as we said they already were which is a third, I can't remember them now, if I can remember them properly, a third by a half by three quarters by five over eight by, if I remember, two thirds, if I'm correct as that, two fifths, multiplied by two fifths, yeah, because I think three fifths was the answer in the previous part to A, wasn't it? 
three fifths. Yeah, so two fifths then is the failure. So again, before we do any multiplication, always make sure that you cancel. Three cancels with three, two cancels with two, five cancels with five, meaning what? One minus top line, one, bottom line, 32. Answer, 31 out of 32. And that's the answer to part two. Okay. Part B, the probability of an archer hitting a target is four over seven. If the archer fires nine arrows, calculate the probability that he will hit the target five times, correct to two decimal places. So now we can't give back our no answer as a fraction. We've got to give it back as a decimal. So have your calculator ready. How many arrows did he fire? Nine. F calculate the probability he hits it many times? Five. So therefore, first of all, how many outcomes are possible? Only two. Either the probability of a hit, which is four over seven, or the probability of a miss, which is three over seven. So because there's only two outcomes, Bernoulli trial. Does one arrow affect the outcome of the other arrow? No, they're independent. Is it repeated a number of times? Yes, nine times. So therefore it has all the hallmarks of a Bernoulli trial. So straight away, that's what we deal with. Nine, and we want five successes. Nine, C5. The probability of success is four over seven, and I want five of them. The probability of failure is three over seven, and I want four of them. And when we work that out, and I've just already worked out here, we get 0.2589. Okay, so that's the probability that he will hit the target five times out of the nine attempts, correct to two decimal places. Well, wobbly line, two decimal places, 0.26. Two decimal places means we keep the second number after the decimal point and we drop the rest, which means we bring it up to 0.26. Calculate the probability that his fifth hit will occur on the ninth arrow, correct to two decimal places again. Okay, so on the fifth, on the ninth arrow, let's just make a list of this, ninth arrow, we want the fifth hit. Now, because we want that to be a hit, we have to use the probability of a hit, which we said back up here was four over seven. So that's four over seven. And that will be the probability of the last arrow, okay? Because it's going to hit the target. Now, what does that mean? There are eight arrows that are fired before the ninth one. And out of those eight, I want four hits. So again, this is going to be where your Bernoulli trial comes in. Eight arrows, that's a repetition of event. Four hits, so there's hit and miss, so there's only two outcomes. The probability of success and failure remains the same after every arrow is fired, so it's a Bernoulli trial. So out of the eight, I want four successes. The probability of success is four over seven, and I want four of them. Probability of failure is three over seven, and I want four of them. And that's going to give me an answer of 0.25. Now you can work it out in your calculator yourself. 0.2517. However, that's the probability of getting four hits with eight arrows. I have to get the fifth hit at the ninth arrow, which is already set in stone. So therefore I bring that over and I multiply it by the 0.2517. And when I multiply those two together, I get an answer of 0 0.1439. Now again, correct the two decimal places, not 0.14. Okay, so nice Bernoulli question there. Question three. The probability that a certain rugby player scores from each place kick he attempts is 85%. During a particular match, he takes five place kicks. Find correct to four decimal places, the probability that he scores on exactly three of the five attempts. Now, he either hits or he misses. He's taking, how many uh, each day? He takes five place kicks. That's a repetition of experiment. The probability of success and failure doesn't change from one kick to the next. Bernoulli trial again. So in this case, we've got the probability of a score being equal to 0.85, which means the probability of a miss is equal to 0.15. So there's the two probabilities in this Bernoulli trial. What do we want? He takes five place kicks and we want to get 
three of them. So that's going to be five C3. So out of five penalty kicks, we want three successes. The probability of success is 0.85. I want three of them. The probability of failure is 0.15, and I want two of them. And when I work that out, that comes out for me as a rugby player. That comes out for me as 0.1382. Now, again, you can use your calculator to do that just to save you time. I'm not going to do it here now because I have it written out already. So 0.1382. And is there any correct four decimal places? Good. Find a probability that he scores for the third time on his fifth attempt. Now, fifth attempt. So fifth, A-T-T-E-M-P-T. -T -T. The fifth attempt, we want a third score. What's the probability of a score? Well, let's go back up here. The probability of a score is 85%. So that's 0.85. So that's going to be definitely 0.85. Because if the fifth attempt is going to be a third score, that means that the probability of scoring will be 0.85 in the fifth attempt. What does that mean? We now have four previous attempts in which I want to get two scores. See it again? Another Bernoulli trial. So both of these are a Bernoulli trial again, as in the previous question. So now we've got 4C2, probability of success, 0.85 to the power of 2, probability of failure, 0.15 to the power of 2. And when I work, work those out, I get, if I can find it now, uh, if I can find it, four, ten, a point zero nine seven five. But that's only the probability of two scores out of the first four. We then have to remember that the fifth attempt is guaranteed to be a success. So we now have to multiply that by 0.85. And when I multiply both of those together, I get 0 0.08290. And that is the probability that he scores for the third time on his fifth attempt. Okay, part three, he scores on at least three attempts here we go at least three attempts now what does that mean that means three scores out of five or four scores out of five or five scores out of five but it could also mean not no scores not one score not two score problem it's bang on the middle doesn't matter what one you take both of them have exactly the same amount of work so in this case here what we can say is the following we want the probability of three scores yeah or the probability of four scores or the probability of five scores all right just work them all out and then this is going to be uh, three attempts during a match so it'll be five c3 and i think we've already done this haven't we because that was the previous one if i remember back up here he scores on exactly three ah so we already have that 0 0.1382 0 0.1382 so i don't need that 0 0.1382 that's already done for me 0.1382 okay good so that's that one or means that we're going to add now we've got to work out four scores out of five so 5c4 probability of success 0.85 raised the power of four by 0.15 probability of failure raised the power of one or five out of five scores by 0.85 which is the success the power of five by 0 0.15 to the power of zero. Okay, so 5C4, that's going to be five. 0 0.85 to the four by 0 0.15 to the one, it's a one there. And that comes out, because again, I have this done quickly, 0 0.3915, okay? And when we work out the third part, 5C5 is one, 0.15 to the power of zero is one. So that just leaves me with 0.85 to the power of five. And that comes out as 0.4437. So what have we got? 0.1382 or 0.3915 or 0.4437. And when you add the three of those together, you get 0.9734. So there's a 97.34% chance that this guy is going to score on at least three attempts during the match. Okay, part B. A, B, and C are three events. A and B are independent. Now, when I hear that word independent, 
I immediately always write down the rule. If A and B are independent, that means that the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B will be equal to the probability of A intersection B. So I don't even wait. As soon as I hear the two events are independent, I write down the rule for independence. Okay. P of A is a third. P of A intersection B is a twelfth. P of C is a half. And P of B union C is 5 over 8. Find the intersection of B and C and investigate whether events B and C are mutually exclusive. Okay, now there's another key words we know. If events are mutually exclusive, they have no intersection. So in that case, here's what we do know. If we want to show that B and C are mutually exclusive, then the probability of B intersection C should be equal to zero. So if they are mutually exclusive, then there should be no intersection between them, no overlap. All right. So let's keep that in mind for the next part of the question. Now, what have we got? So let's write down, we have P of A is equal to one over three. P of A intersection B is equal to a twelfth. P of C is a half. And P of B union C is equal to five over eight. And what else do I know? I know that A and B are independent. So I have this rule here. So immediately, just take a look at this rule. What can I fill into this rule? Well, I can fill in P of A and I can fill in P of A intersection B, which means that the only thing I won't know is P B, which I can solve. So P of A is a third multiplied by the probability of B is equal to the probability of the intersection one over 12. So the probability of B is 1 over 12 multiplied by 3 over 1, which is 1 over 4. So now I've got the probability of B, 1 over 4. Okay, what else do I know? Well, now I want to focus on B and C. So I know that B is a quarter, and I know that B union C is 5 over 8, and I know that C is 1 over 2. So maybe I've got enough information here to try and work out what the intersection is. So let's just think about that. The union is the addition of P and C. So in other words, the probability of B union C is equal to the probability of B plus the probability of C. Now, a little bit of a problem because if we have B union C, we're talking about B plus the intersection plus C. But if I just add B and C together, don't I count the intersection twice? Look, B plus C. So I've counted the intersection twice. So therefore I have to take away from that any intersection that's between B and C. Got that? Now what do I know? Do I know the probability of B union C? Yes, that's 5 over 8. Do I know the probability of B? Well I just discovered that in the previous part of this question, which is a quarter. Do I know the probability of C? Yep, they gave me that as a half minus P of B intersection C. So actually, this is a, a quite an algebraic question, because now what we have is minus the probability of B intersection C being equal to 5 over 8 minus a quarter, 5 over 8 minus a quarter minus a half. OK, and what's that going to come out as? Well, that comes out as minus 1 over 8, and that's equal to minus the probability of B intersection C, which means that 1 over 8 is equal to the probability of B intersection C. What did the question say? Investigate if B and C are mutually exclusive. Now, what did I write up here earlier on? Up here earlier on, I wrote, if they're mutually exclusive, there will be no intersection. I've just proved that there is an intersection. There's an intersection of an eighth. So therefore, since there is overlap here, they are not mutually exclusive. Not mutually exclusive and that's because the intersection is an eighth so if there is overlap between the two that means b and c have events that can occur simultaneously so they cannot be mutually exclusive okay is that it oh yeah question five excuse me the bank issues a unique four digit pin code to customers to use with their debit or credit cards the code is chosen at random from the digits zero to nine. A code cannot begin with zero, but digits may be repeated. For example, 1995, etc. Find the total number of possible four digit pin codes in which no digit is repeated. Okay, just underline that. No digit is repeated 
as a percentage fraction, so something over something, so we're going to need two things, that's what a percentage is, of the total number of possible codes. Okay, so I need two things here. I need, first of all, the total number of codes. Okay, now that's the total number of codes with no repetition. Um, oh, sorry, as I, no, my apologies, but I read that wrong, try that again. Okay, let's just do that again. So find a total number of possible four digit pin codes in which no digit is repeated as a percentage of the total number of possible codes. Okay, so now I get you. So now, total number, blue, thank you. So total number of codes, well, let's see. We've got a four digit pin to create. So what are the total number of codes? Well, what are we told? We're told from the beginning that a code cannot begin with zero. See that? A code cannot begin with zero, which means that zero to nine, that's 10 digits. But if it can't begin with zero, that means you have nine possible in there. OK, so zero can't take the first position, which leaves nine digits available. Now, if I use a digit, that should leave me with eight digits for the second box. However, zero is now allowed back in. Not correct. And repetition is allowed. So therefore, that brings it back up to 10 again, which means there are 10 available for that and 10 available for this. So therefore, the answer for the total number of codes is 9,000. OK, now what else do I need? I want four pi uh, digit pin numbers in which no digit is repeated. So no digit repeated. OK, so let's think about that. So again, we've got our four boxes to fill. Now, zero can't go into the first box. So that means there are nine digits available. I'm going to use one of them, which should leave me with eight. But zero is allowed back in again. So that means the second box is nine. And then I'm going to use one of them that can't be repeated, which brings that to eight. And then I'm going to use one of them which can't be repeated, which brings that down to seven. OK, so think about that again. Zero cannot take first position. So that's nine out of the digits that are left. So any one of those nine can take that. If it's a case that I use one of them, I should drop to eight. But zero is allowed back into the second position, which brings it up to nine. And then if I use one of those digits, I can't repeat it again, which brings it down to eight. Use one of them, I can't repeat that, brings it down to seven. So in that case, we get an answer of 4,536 different ways. Now, that's not the question. Question says... What is the percentage of four pin, four digit pin numbers in which no digit is repeated as a percentage of the total number? So that's just simply 4,536 out of 9,000 multiplied by 100. They'll cancel. So it's the same as 4,536 divided by 90. And that comes out as 50.4%. OK, part B, a pin code in which no digit is repeated is issued to a customer. How many different pin codes which are even numbers greater than 3000 are possible? Now, if they're even, they have to end in two, four, six, eight or zero. OK, so if even. Then they have to end, so they end in two, four, six, eight or zero. But here's the problem. How many pin codes greater than 3000? That means they can start with three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They can't start with zero. OK, now do you see the overlap? If it starts with three, all five even numbers are available. But if it was to start at four, only four of these would be available. So now we've got two scenarios. So what's scenario one? Scenario one is as follows. If I start with three, five, seven or nine, then all the even numbers are available to end this thing. So let's think about that. Yeah, pin numbers. One, two, three and four. So I've got four things, four spaces to fill. If I start with three, five, seven or nine, 
So if I start with any of them, that means that all five even numbers are available for the last position. You see that? So if I start with three, five, seven or nine, that's the first scenario. That means there are four numbers that I can start with here, which will give me all five even numbers available. Now, if I use one digit in the first box and one digit in the second box, that means that out of the original 10, I have eight left. And then if I use one of them, that will give me, and it can't be repeated, that will give me seven. So therefore, in that case, when I multiply out scenario number one, I get 1,120. What about scenario two? Well, again, let's take a look at these four numbers that we've got to fill. Now, in that case, what about starting with four, six, or eight? If I start with four, six, or eight, that means that the number of even numbers available to finish this thing is diminished by one. So even though I have three even numbers I can start with, if I start with any one of the three evens, that reduces the number of available even numbers to me down to four. See? Now, if one number takes the first box and one number takes the second box, you still have exactly the same in the middle. Eight are available to take second position, seven are available to take third position, and we multiply. And when we multiply these, we get 672. So it's either scenario one or scenario two, which means I'm going to add both of those together. And when I do so, I get 1,000, hopefully 792. So that's an unusual question. If the numbers are to be greater than 3,000, but to be even, they have to finish with an even number. But if they start with even and are to finish with even, the number of evens available to finish with are reduced. If they start with an odd number and they finish with an even, then all the even numbers are available to finish the numbers. So just keep those two scenarios in your head. And because it's one or the other, you add the two results at the end. Okay, find the probability that all of the digits in the PIN code issued are in ascending order, e.g. 3469 or 2789. Okay, find the probability all the digits in the PIN code issued are in ascending order. What's the only condition here? The only condition here is that zero cannot be used. So therefore, there are nine digits left. Now, out of those nine, how many four can I choose? I'm sorry, how many of those nine, how many can I choose the pin number four? So nine digits, choose four. Okay. And out of those four, how many ways can they be ordered in increasing order? And the answer is one. See that? So nine C4 multiplied by one, because there's only one way that you can get a number in increasing order. All right. So out of the nine digits, I choose any four, I'm leaving zero out because I can't start with zero. So out of nine, choose four, and there's only one way for them to be arranged, and that's an increasing order. So nine C4 works out as 126. Okay. That's it. 126. Yeah, that's it. Oh yeah, sorry. And no repetitions. That's yeah, my mistake. And no repetitions, of course. Find the probability. That's the number of ways. So find the probability. When you see that probability, it's a fraction. Don't forget that. Now, here's the key thing. It's 9C4. That's 126 ways. But the digits cannot be repeated. So let's just go back up here for a moment. Did we find out earlier on what the probability was of no repetition? We did. There it is. 4536. So therefore, there are 126 ways out of four five three six to turn into a probability and 126 out of four five three six is one out of 36 and that's it so one two six that's the number of ways i can choose four out of the remaining nine i multiply that by one because there's only one way to keep those numbers in order and that is in ascending order and then 126 is the number of ways I can do that but there are 4536 different ways that I can have the numbers uh, not repeating themselves so 126 out of that 4536 is the number of ways that the digits will not be repeated and will be in ascending order so it's 1 over 36 okay
Part C. Six students compare the months in which they celebrate their birthdays. Assuming that all months are equally likely, find the probability that no two students were born in the same month. And give your answer correct to four decimal places. Now let's think about that. Probably no two students were born in the same month. If no two students are born in the same month, what's another way to say the same thing? All born on different months. So now I'm looking for the probability that all were born on different months. Okay, so how many people are there? Six people. The first person can be born on any one of the 12 out of the 12 months. Okay, and the next person then, if they're not going to be born on that, can be born on any of the remaining 11 out of 12. The next person can be born on any, get the idea, 10 out of 12, 9 out of 12, 8 out of 12, many people was there, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 7 out of 12. Now before you go mad multiplying this thing out, look for cancellation. That's 1, okay? Then I have cancellation here uh, that goes in there. 2 goes in there four times and 2 goes in there six times, okay? 2 will go in there three times and 2 will go in there five times. I don't think there's any more cancellation there. 3 will go in there three times. That will go in there four times. That 4 knocks out that 4. Do you see, I've just shown you, always try to simplify before you actually go and solve. But when you do this thing and when you do multiply it out, you get an answer in decimal form, as your calculator will give you, of 0.2228. And that is to for, correct to four decimal places. All right. Now you can keep going to your heart's content. Three goes into 12 four times there. And you can just keep on cancelling. Just makes it that little bit easier to multiply out. But when you do all that multiplication in your calculator, then you get an answer of 0.2228. Okay. And that's it. Yeah. That's the end of it. So there are the four questions that came up last year. Two from the DEBs, two from the exam craft. Now I would ask you, having a look at those, Go back over the previous exam questions from the leaving cert. I gave you that sheet in Google Classroom. Work your way down through them. And if you happen to hit one that's proven anyway difficulty, uh, proven to be difficult, send it to me in an email. Give me the year and give me the number and I'll send you back the solution.